Hi, folks. Um, I just want to welcome everyone who is here to join us for the uh, up for the Faculty Insights on COVID-19 uh, virtual seminar series. Uh, we, before I get into introducing our guest today, Arun Sundararajan, I wanted to just let everyone know that we have a really busy week next week coming up. Uh, it is going to be the final week in this part of the series. We'll take a break for final exams and for the virtual graduation. And then we'll be back in the beginning of, in the end of May uh, with a once a week schedule. Uh, but today we are really lucky to have Arun Sundararajan, who is going to be talking to us about crisis and technological change and how COVID-19 will really affect, um, will accelerate digital transformation and, and catalyze a, a whole new world. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Arun, and take it away. Okay, thank you, Baria. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope all of you are um, safe and healthy wherever you are. Um, this is a real background. It's not one of those Zoom backgrounds. Um, I can even demonstrate that it's a real background by taking out a book um, that I have on my shelf, which coincidentally is my book, um, right next to a book called Getting It Right, which I hope will be the title of the biography they write about me. You know, often it helps to sort of look back in history to try and understand uh, what is the relationship between crisis and technological change, um, both during the crisis and after. So when people think about technological response to crisis, a lot of people think about the Manhattan Project, like you know the great minds of the world all coming together um, to collectively work on a problem that addresses the crisis. And we're certainly seeing some Manhattan Project-like um, efforts that are taking place in response to COVID, from the Scientists to Stop COVID-19 group to Bill Gates funding seven parallel sort of you know vaccine manufacturing efforts. But you know, I if if, if we really want to understand how COVID is going to affect technological change long term. Um, it helps to step back and distinguish between um, the innovation that takes place during a crisis. You know, I mean, during World War II, we had the Manhattan Project. We had a tremendous amount of innovation in um, code breaking. Um, you had Grace Hopper um, programming the Harvard Mark I computing machine for projectile trajectories. Um, you know, there was innovation in aviation technology. And all of that was <clears throat> sort of directed at addressing the crisis at hand. Um, but a lot of the change that was driven by technology came later because of technological spillovers from these innovations. You know, the computer industry was birthed by, like, you know, the Mark I and ENIAC. Um, you know, um, I'm sure that the aviation industry was sort of accelerated dramatically by, um, like, you know, innovation during World War II. Um, the foundations for information security were laid by uh, the cryptographic research that was done there. And so spillovers are an important part of understanding like, you know, technological change during a crisis. And perhaps even more importantly, it's good to keep track of what other changes are taking place surrounding the crisis and how will they interact with technological change. For example, during World War II, um, like, you know, women joined the workforce at unprecedented rates, and that was sort of a really important catalyst for a lot of the technological change of the 20th century. Returning veterans wanted to live in the suburbs, and that sort of interacted with the progress in the automotive or the internal combustion industry. And so a change that isn't really, <clears throat> you know, sort of thought about a lot um, in the context of World War II was, um, you know, the shelter at home uh, protocols that people had to follow for many years during the bombing raids. Whereas for us, shelter in place is really central to a lot of the changes that I'm going to be talking about and predicting. And a good way to sort of, um, for us to visualize just how profound the shelter in place impacts have been on human movement um, is by using data from a company called SafeGraph that tracks 
like you know the movement of mobile phones and so this is actually tracking relative to february 12th um how many people were at home and uh, so if you look at on march 10th um like you know uh, fewer people were at home than on february 12th because perhaps sort of the weather got warmer but as like you know covid fears grew and um the shelter in place um orders started to um like you know sort of come down from different local governments we can see a progressive increase in the fraction of the population or the number of people who are actually staying at home um it peaked around april 14th um and it started to sort of subside since then um i have um like you know similar <clears throat> visualizations of the new york city area which reveal very interesting things about manhattan residents um if we have time later in the talk um but the shelter at home is really what is um driving a lot of the profound and massive and maybe unprecedented short term changes that we're seeing um we've all seen the pictures of <clears throat> you know unemployment filings and um, you know the 5.4% unemployment number in march is definitely going to grow to a sort of a much much greater number in the months to come um you know we've seen big changes in what people are spending their money on some of these changes will persist um some of these changes will sort of roll back i mean we're not going to be buying as many rubber gloves in the future but they will certainly in many cases alter the trajectory of ongoing change um you know we've seen a dramatic rise across a range of contexts um from social engagements to work to the virtual classroom of the use of digital interfaces um that has sort of paralleled um the fall in our sort of physical world mobility i heard a new term a few days ago zoom background envy which seems to have been spawned by this sort of embracing of the digital virtual space as a legitimate sort of workplace um and looking a little further forward um what the shock is leading to is um an economic contraction um the 4.8 percent contraction that was reported for q1 will almost certainly be small compared to what we are expecting in q2 definitely a double digit contraction um and you know many small businesses are already failing this failure rate and the bankruptcy rate is going to go up dramatically in the months to come and perhaps not reported on as widely by the press but certainly sort of equally important in thinking about um like you know sort of technology driven change is shifting attitudes towards human contact so those of you who are in new york i'm sure you've sort of walked on the sidewalk you think should should i you know move to the left should i move to the right i mean trading off that um like you know desire for personal health safety with the natural instinct we have to sort of not avoid our fellow human being and so all of these changes are happening like you know as a consequence of covid and as a consequence of shelter in place and it's important to realize that um like you know the uh, rate at which we've frozen the economy is going to be much greater than the rate at which we thaw the economy um you know economies are interconnected different geographies will open at different times different countries will open at different times and so that will sort of be an impediment there will be labor market viscosity i mean you know the consumer response may be you know more measured and circumspect than we expect and so during this time of recovery um you know what changes that have been caused during the freeze time will persist and what transformation trajectories will be changed and also interestingly like you know as we sort of get into this recovery period um we are creating sort of interesting new spaces for innovation and so what new opportunities will be created so that's what i want to focus the rest of the session on and of course a good place to start when talking about technological change is scientific progress and you know i think of it as one of four forces that is shaping technology driven changes um you know during covid-19 certainly in the biotech and pharma spaces we are seeing dramatic rises in the pace of scientific progress but like you know stepping back for a second and thinking this as thinking of this as sort of a more general factor certainly sort of technological change and its pace drives technology driven change um we saw that with the transistors we saw that with tcp ip and the internet we're going to see it with quantum computing in the years to come 
But it's a real mistake to think about that as being the central aspect of technology-driven change in business and society. Um, <clears throat> this is a view of like you know technological determinant determinism that you know sort of changes in technology drive changes in business and society, and that's really not the case. Um, there are other forces that shape whether this technology will also will eventually translate into real business change. And uh, the forces include the economic forces. Um, so, for example, the technology for social networking at scale existed when Orkut and Friendster came along and built the technology. But it took sort of like, you know, Facebook building critical mass and the power of network effects taking over to really accelerate and sort of drive that technology driven change. Uh, there's a wide variety of institutional factors that shape whether, like, you know, technology is in fact going to, um, like, you know, cause the changes that we expect it to. Um, in the realm of automation, um, technological possibilities have always lagged sort of like, you know, business um, implementation. You know, anybody who's used a retail, self-retail checkout counter knows this. This doesn't represent the cutting edge AI technology of the day. Um, and a lot of that is caused by labor viscosity, sort of like, you know, resistance from labor markets. Um, there are political factors that often come into play. I mean, I think the self-driving trucks, the fully autonomous trucks, the technology will be ready a lot sooner than we see them rolled out onto the road because of political pushback. Um, often sort of access to capital and credit availability are other institutional factors that shape whether technology-driven change that we expect actually starts to play out. And then finally, and perhaps sort of most importantly, are the behavioral aspects. Um, you know, in any technology-driven change, whether it's uh, switching from using a Rolodex to using a Palm Pilot, like, you know, giving up your second car in favor of pressing a button and getting an Uber, um, there are profound behavior changes that are necessary before the technology-driven change is widespread. There are routines we get into that have to be changed. I mean, could it be something as simple as reading a newspaper that will sort of cause a very big difference between the technological possibility and like, you know, the business or social reality. Um, there's also a process of social legitimization that um, shapes whether or not technology driven change becomes widespread. You know, in Airbnb's early days, um, they were um, <clears throat> seen as a place where like, you know, people looking for a good deal or college students would stay. And it took a few years before you were talking to your friends and your friends would say, yeah, I'm staying in an Airbnb. And there's a process of sort of social acceptance that comes from that kind of legitimization. Um, I think the technology for self-driving cars will be ready a lot sooner than we see people actually sitting in the back seat and trusting the car, like letting it drive by a school zone. And so broader social acceptance is an important part of technology-driven change. So why am I talking about this? Well, it's because, um, you know, the accelerating effects of the crisis are going to be shaped in part by how are these factors have been changed by the economic shock that we are experiencing right now. I think in many cases on that technology adoption curve, we will see a leapfrogging like, you know, from the place we were in February of 2020 to a very different point on the technology adoption curve, which may sort of then alter, like, you know, sort of the future trajectory of that technology driven change. And like, you know, as we go through the talk, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different examples that sort of bring these ideas to life. And in other cases, we might see a technology that would have otherwise failed um, sort of leapfrogging over the chasm that like, you know, a lot of technology products succumb to um, and actually becoming a mainstream technology because of sort of like, you know, sort of the push that it was given, you know, during this two or three months of lockdown. So let's sort of dive into a bunch of specific examples to sort of bring this framework to life. Um, you know, retail is an interesting one because over the last 25 years, we have been on a gradual and measured sort of trajectory of shifting our shopping away from physical stores to e-commerce and online shopping. You know, Amazon and Buy.com, like, you know, were founded literally like 25 years ago. And so the pace of change has been slow and it's largely been driven by behavior change, you know, and by acceptance of the fact that I can now buy this thing online instead of going to the store for it. And so the kind of shock that we've seen during, um, like, you know, shelter in place 
is certainly going to alter that trajectory because you know e-commerce activity is up by you know depending on what you look at i've been looking at walmart.com and walmart data with one of our phd students rui sun and um you know, there's certainly sort of a near doubling of walmart.com activity from what was anticipated and other estimates seem to suggest that you do have this sort of doubling of e-commerce activity so that's not surprising um but you know what is actually sort of perhaps going to persist is the behavior change of going to a retailer's site because you can't go to their store so i went to the uniqlo site because i needed to buy shirts you know i was um, you know it's only so frequently one can do laundry and i couldn't go to the store so there i was on the uniqlo website and i had a good experience and so that's probably going to be a behavior that persists rather than shopping for everything on amazon and walmart.com um brands that include lululemon and nike have seen sort of greater than expected growth rates um in their e-commerce activity as a consequence of this and i think a lot of that will persist which is why you see um shopify actually outperforming walmart and amazon relative to like you know where they were on february 19th that was the peak of the s&p 500 so the e-commerce guys have done better than the market um since the s&p peak um and shopify which powers a lot of e-commerce sites is doing even better than the giants walmart and amazon and you compare this to sort of the traditional retail you are seeing an acceleration of like you know sort of the death of traditional retail um and so you know those are changes where we are seeing an acceleration of what has been sort of playing out um for many many years um i think other shifts that we're going to see is are um like you know you know a lot of retail is driven by small businesses selling online through a shopify or through the amazon marketplace um there's certainly um like you know going to be a very significant shift away from small retailers that rely purely on physical world presence and towards those that have a digital side to them and this is being driven in part by the strategies that they're following or that they're projecting that they're going to follow post pandemic they're going to shift a lot of their marketing and a lot of their channel focus to online but it's also being caused going to be caused by survivor bias right i mean the small online retail small retailers that survive are much more likely to be the online ones because they have not lost business they've actually gained business so the landscape of retail that we look at um is going to look very different uh, traditional retail and big box retail is going to take a further hit as attitudes towards going to the mall change um because that is sort of like you know one of the places where they still see a lot of their business and it's unclear whether people will congregate at shop at the shopping malls post pandemic the way they did pre pandemic so if we look at automation through this lens um you know recession or an economic downturn can often be a good time for accelerating creative destruction or for accelerating technology driven change you know the opportunity cost of implementing a new technology is lower during a slowdown and in some ways the churn of the slowdown and the recession makes things more amenable to the implementation of a productivity enhancing technology but there are a couple of factors that traditionally hold this creative destruction back um one is labor market inefficiencies i think that's not going to be a factor at during this particular crisis because we've seen a labor market shock of the kind that we've never really seen before and this is actually perhaps sort of clearing the path rather than resisting investments that companies are going to be making in the future into like you know sort of the automation investments that perhaps have been planned for many years but not implemented for a wide variety of other factors what might hold the pace of automation back are other institutional factors i mean in particular credit availability um if deficit spending sort of grows the way we expected to theoretically that's likely to raise, raise the cost of capital for a lot of businesses and that may make sort of large capex harder um but overall it seems like you know covid will be automation accelerating rather than decelerating um because another factor that may come into play is that like you know because of us working at home um companies have been forced to sort of rethink how they do work and often that kind of rethinking of the tasks involved in like you know sort of what you produce can be a good pre precursor 
to the kind of process change that is important, um, like, you know, that must accompany um, um, automation investments. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that this particular, um, like, you know, the enabling of new work templates that we've seen happen because of people working at home is going to accelerate a different kind of future of work change, um, the move away from full-time employment and towards platform work a lot more because companies have figured out how to get their work done while people are remote. And so it's not a big leap to saying, well, if they're going to be remote, maybe we can, you know, use them on demand or use them from another country or use them through a platform. Um, this legitimization of remote work, both in the mind of the person who is today a full time employee or was in February and in the minds of the companies of, hey, this isn't like, you know, um, you know, we've tried this model of work and it seems to work. And we've understood its weaknesses. And so now we can move forward with the transition away from employment to platform work. I think the upcoming or the ongoing recession will also catalyze that further. I mean, if you look at the financial crisis um, and the Great Recession, that spawned um, many of like, you know, the early gig economy platforms. Um, Uber Cab thrived on black car drivers who had lost a lot of their banking and other corporate business um, because of the recession. Um, people shifted to hosting on Airbnb, getting gigs from TaskRabbit to try and supplement their income, you know, during hard economic times. And so, you know, the supplementing your income through platform work supply is going to grow quite dramatically over the next couple of years. Um, I think another factor is that a big impediment to the move to platform work, which is the lack of a social safety net, you know, um, a big move towards removing that impediment came in the CARES Act that was passed about a month ago, which extended unemployment benefits, not just to full-time employees who had lost their jobs, but also to um, gig workers. So I think this was a big step forward in legitimizing in the eyes of legislators the idea that you need to build a safety net, not just for the full-time employee, but for um, like, you know, sort of a wide variety of different forms of work. Now, moving on to other industries, um, you know, in the on-demand space, we've certainly seen a shock to the on-demand food industry in lots of different ways. Um, I think that meal kits have crossed the chasm. I mean, many companies have seen 100% growth. Um, I think the industry in general has seen a dramatic acceleration in its growth. And so, you know, I expect a lot of these companies that otherwise would have failed to have survived because like, you know, um, people are experimenting with meal kits at home, like during the lockdown. Um, there's good evidence that the demand for Uber Eats and DoorDash like, um, like, you know, platforms has also risen. If you look at this on a restaurant by restaurant basis, order volumes have gone up post pandemic compared to pre pandemic. And so this is particularly true for small and medium sized restaurants. Um, but I think the longer term, um, like, you know, shape of the industry is going to be shape is, is, is going to be driven in part by the extremely high failure rates that we anticipate over the coming months. I mean, according to the National Restaurant Association, 3% of restaurants in the United States went out of business in March and 11% are expected to declare bankruptcy in April. Um, we, we don't know exactly what the numbers are, but this was a projection. And so we're seeing a massive sort of reshaping of, and a lot of these restaurateurs, of course, will go back and start new restaurants. But if you think about the profile of restaurants that survive, again, will be the ones that rely more on the digital channel. And so the mix is going to be much more digital. A lot of restauranters or cooks who worked at these restaurants, instead of starting a new restaurant in a credit constrained environment in a recession, may instead set up a cloud kitchen and start an online only business. So I think we're going to see a dramatic shift away from sort of in person and towards online that is catalyzed by um, like, you know, by the um, by COVID. Um, moving to telemedicine, um, you know, we've known for a couple of months that telemedicine is very well suited for this crisis because of what it delivers and combined with like, you know, us being at home. And, you know, there was an interesting study that a group of NYU professors have published, Man et al. 2020, that has documented within the NYU medical system 
a hundredfold increase in the number of people using telemedicine between March 5th and April 5th. And something close to a hundredfold increase in the number of participating doctors as well. And so again, this behavior change and legitimization of telemedicine has received an enormous push forward. And what's particularly interesting about the MAN study is that comparing people who were extremely sort of well-trained for telemedicine and had sort of special technology, looking at uh, patient satisfaction rates then and patient satisfaction rates from like, you know, all of the people who are just sort of tossed into the telemedicine world, they are essentially the same. And so not only have we seen a lot of people embrace telemedicine, but this embracing has been done in a way that has also led to sort of high customer satisfaction. Um, I expect that urban transit is going to see some pretty dramatic changes. Um, you have to think of urban transit as being on a spectrum from mass transit to shared transit and Uber and Uber pool <clears throat> to sort of individual transit, but shared implement like, you know, shared bicycle or a shared scooter to like, you know, driving your own car, which is still sort of a vast majority of what Americans do. So although we are probably going to see shifts um, in like, you know, we've seen a lot of drop in the use of technologies like Uber. But post-pandemic, I think that there will be a shift sort of progressively towards sort of controlling your space. And so from mass transit to using Uber, certainly from using Uber pool to using Uber, perhaps from using Uber to experimenting with scooters and bicycles, and cities are building infrastructure like Paris for like, you know, a future in which you will be relying much more on like, you know, sort of shared two wheelers than on cars and taxis. Um, but we also will see a shift towards um, <clears throat> people wanting to move out of cities and towards the suburbs. And so that may slow the pace at which people are switching out of owning cars and using shared transportation. And the behavior change of selling your second car and using Uber or Lyft instead, that I think is also going to be slowed by perceptions of I'd rather be in control of my own space. Now, this control over your space dimension um, is particularly interesting when you look at um, like, you know, what the future of the travel industry is going to be. <clears throat> I think no industry is going to take a bigger hit than the travel industry this year. Um, they're going to see a contraction of perhaps more than 50%. Um, but in a recent survey done by Skift, um, which was polling people about um, what are they likely, what kind of accommodation are they likely to choose post-pandemic, um, compared to the choices that they were making in Jan and Feb, you saw an interesting shift away from chain hotels and towards vacation rentals and Airbnb-like accommodations. <clears throat> so my prognosis is that the pandemic is going to be good for the Airbnb-like business model um, in the long run for a number of different reasons. Uh, one reason being this consumer preference for space control um, but it's also because Airbnb's business model is just much better suited for low utilization. <clears throat> you know, a hotel can't sort of utilize its rooms one third of the time, but Airbnb can, in fact, sort of institute a 72 hour period between stays, still have a viable business model and make people feel a lot safer. And they have, in fact, released that feature along with a um, sort of a protocol for host cleaning that hosts can adopt. And so that's definitely going to be an interesting shift. Now, another shift that we're seeing is a shift away from <clears throat> international travel and towards local travel. Um, this was a shift that was already underway in the United States. Um, but I think that this is going to be dramatically accelerated, a shift away from urban travel and towards beaches and a shift away from hotels and towards Airbnb. None of these is good news for New York City's tourism department, actually, because we rely on international, we rely on urban, and we rely on hotels. And so that's something that does give me some concern. Um, and uh, I guess the final industry that I look at is entertainment. I think that there's certainly been sort of a coming of age of the uh, non-co-located shared video experience. So sort of been in the works for a while, but we've really seen like, you know, platforms like Squad and Netflix Party take off. 
Um, and I think that that'll be a change that persists in people's behavior post pandemic. <clears throat> we were already seeing a shift in preferences away from going to a movie theater and streaming a new video at home. I think that's certainly going to be accelerated by like, you know, the pandemic. And we've all seen the numbers that Netflix is growing. And so that shift away from cable and towards on demand will continue on its trajectory, perhaps at a slightly higher pace. So I'll end with some comments on, <clears throat> you know, one technological change that we're certainly seeing a lot of action around. Um, and this is contact tracing. Um, we've seen systems successfully implemented by the Singapore government. There was the 100 meter um, technology in Korea that became very popular. Um, I think a couple of days ago, Apple and Google announced an API for the creation of contact tracing applications, <clears throat> you know, in the United States and many other parts of the world. And I think that the um, what we really need to give thought to in this context is making sure that the technology works in unison with like, you know, other systems that are necessary for the technology to actually get value. And so contact tracing or like, you know, contact notification by itself is not going to be that useful unless like, you know, it is accompanied by like, you know, sort of like, you know, the health policy actions that can use that technology. I mean, if you look at some of the early players in the contact tracing space, I mean, they are, <clears throat> you know, companies who used to track fans or who used to sort of have apps that would tell you where your friends are. And so, you know, there's a lot of nuance that is going to be necessary in thinking about how do we integrate this into like, you know, the um, health policy response. And the fear I have is that as the idea of using our personal contact data for the public good starts to get socialized and legitimized, that it could spill over into other realms of life, for example, like law enforcement. And, um, you know, governance always lags technological progress. I think that we are at a point where in this particular context, um, the lag has become even greater. <clears throat> and I think that's a really important dimension of this conversation because, you know, these platforms that we rely on are the world that we are going to live in in the coming decades. And very rapidly, we are putting in place, like, you know, the template for their design. So it's really important that in defining this new social contract and the trade-off between the individual and the collective, um, we consciously design the world that we want and don't let other people design it for us. <clears throat> so in, in, in closing, um, you know, my colleague Vasandar and I wrote about digital spaces of interaction about 15 years ago, and it's really interesting to have seen them come to life <clears throat> through the... Um, you know, sort of through this lockdown and through the widespread sort of um, um, changes that we've seen over the last six weeks in the workplace, um, like, you know, in entertainment and socialization. Um, I realize I have focused almost exclusively on digital technology and not other technologies. There will certainly be, you know, sort of dramatic improvements in biotech and pharma tech that, you know, I haven't talked about, maybe a different talk. But I think some of the key words that we're going to be associating much more with business and technological change in the coming months are, um, <clears throat> you know, an emphasis that businesses may place on adaptability, um, less of a dependence on global and more of a dependence on local, um, supply chain flexibility, and thinking about digital channels as ways of building business model resilience. Perhaps we will see sort of a resurgence of the diversification idea of the 60s um, as sort of a business survival strategy. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we still have 20 or 25 minutes for questions. Um, hope you enjoy this. Thank you for your time. And um, but yeah, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Arun. I have to say it was a great talk and it feels almost like you gave us a crystal ball to peer into to uh, get a sense of what we would be seeing in the world um, going forward. I have a whole bunch of questions that are coming in. I'm going to ask you just a few uh, to sort of of my own to start things off and, um, and, and then I'll turn to the questions from the audience. I guess uh, you kind of mentioned that um, people have become more accepting of digital surveillance. 
as a response to the crisis. And I wonder what you think are the downstream effects of legitimating that and what forms of digital governance would ensure that the privacy and freedom that people surrender is in the service of the social good that people are surrendering it for rather than benefiting a small set of self-interested parties or increasing autocracy uh, and, and diminishing our freedoms. Well, um, it's a tough problem to solve because, um, you know, uh, the, <clears throat> the choices that are being made now are, um, you know, sort of being driven by, um, you know, we've sort of put our um, what is in the individual good on hold a little in favor of what is in the collective good. And uh, we haven't really thought a lot about like, you know, what are the governance implications of the use of digital surveillance for contact tracing for public health? And so like a lot of other technological changes that have preceded it, like, you know, the rise of digital advertising and so on, um, <clears throat> it's like the system is designed for its performance without taking into account sort of thinking about like, you know, what are important, like, you know, sort of governance choices um, that have to be made that like, you know, balance the individual with the social good and what are the long run implications I have to say that um, in looking at Apple and um, Google's choices in their release of the API, I do see much greater attention <clears throat> being paid to this trade-off than would have been, say, 10 years ago. So, you know, I'm optimistic that we're in a better place now than we were a few years ago in thinking about individual control over the data, like, you know, the data being stored on your phone rather than in a central database, the data only lasting a certain amount of time. Um, but what worries me is sort of the decentralized nature of the development effort. There are standards being put out by private tech platforms. There's a whole host of app developers that are going to sort of develop apps. There's a bunch of state and local governments that are gonna adopt these apps. And so even if like, you know, the big tech players are thinking carefully about like, you know, the right design and making sort of better than usual governance choices. Um, you know, there are gonna be these unintended consequences because this isn't like, you know, some countries a centrally controlled effort. Um, it's much more decentralized and free market. Yeah, uh, that's really helpful. We've got a bunch of questions, several questions from the audience that are all related to <clears throat> online education. Uh, and so, um, so kind of of the form of, you know, what are the predictions that you have for, you know, which you did touch on with Zoom and, and uh, earlier, uh, but what predictions you have for the education sector from pre-K to post-grad and what you think will happen with online education and online programs and, um, and what will be the outcome of that for society? Well, um, I think that, uh, you know, we've certainly seen sort of a behavior changing shock, <clears throat> you know, in, on, in education across the spectrum in this move to digital. Um, and so the uh, legitimization and the behavior change have happened not just at the student level, but at the teacher and professor level, which is often sort of like, you know, the harder transition, like you and I are both professors, we know how hard it is to get professors to um, like, you know, change what they do. Um, I hope none of my colleagues are watching this. Uh, my colleagues are wonderful. Like, you know, I'm not talking about my colleagues. I'm talking about all those other professors. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think what we're going to see as the real impact of COVID on online education, education in general, is dramatic expansion. Um, we are shoring up and dramatically sort of improving our digital access infrastructure in the K-12 realm, sort of plugging the gaps over there through necessity. Um, we are generating a tremendous amount of online content that otherwise may not have been generated at the university level. And a lot of this will sort of spread <clears throat> to sort of like, you know, 10x, 100x to populations who may not have had access to this kind of content before. And I think it will accelerate the shift in the mix between online and in-person, 
you know, many of us have embraced, embraced hybrid models of teaching over the last 10 years. Um, I think that will sort of probably accelerate a little, um, but I don't see this as fundamentally changing um, like, you know, the university in any sort of significant way. I mean, it will, like, you know, we have been on a path where, you know, smaller colleges and smaller universities have seen challenges to their business models, like, you know, ever since the emergence of Coursera. Um, and that will continue. Um, but, uh, you know, the, you know, my, my feeling is that the product of a university like ours um, will not be very different from what it is today, like, you know, the highly optimized product that it is today, in a few years, um, the mix of channels may change a little. Yeah, um, so uh, thank you. There are a bunch of questions in here that kind of relate to the sharing economy. And, and we all know that you are an expert and have written extensively about the rise of the sharing economy. And uh, there are a bunch of questions that relate to them Things like um, how businesses can take advantage of, you know, sharing economy ethos, um, what uh, returning, like what the providers, like when people are going to feel comfortable <clears throat> with returning to a sharing economy. And I know for me, um, businesses like Airbnb and Uber require trusting strangers rather than institutions. <laughs> And you pointed out that that has become more normative over time, but COVID-19 makes us look at our fellow citizens with fear. And you specifically referred to changing attitudes to human contact. The recession generalizes this even further, like to the financial realm. Maybe people won't be as trusting for those seeking peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, so what path do you see to restoring trust, returning sharing, sharing economy businesses to growth? And then, you know, kind of in that broad arena, maybe you could also speak about how non-sharing economy businesses can take advantage and, and what it would take for people to get comfortable again with the sharing economy ethos. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, a, <clears throat> a I mean, that, 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 that's certainly sort of an, important sort of dimension of things. Um, you know, there's, I, I think one of the foundational elements of sharing economy business models is the, um, like, you know, is the greater resilience that these business models have and the lower need for capital. And so you look at sort of the capital intensity of Airbnb or Uber relative to like, you know, the hotel industry or the auto industry um, and you look at like, you know, the flexibility, like, you know, this, uh, they're, they're creating invisible infrastructure in a sense, right? So it can ebb and flow um, with uh, big changes in demand uh, without the same kind of impact that the industrial age, that it would have on an industrial age business model. And so from that point of view, I'm optimistic about the prospects, like, you know, post COVID of the sharing economy platforms because of this greater resilience and sort of greater flexibility. Um, <clears throat> I think that there will be sort of like, you know, a slow process of recovery as people sort of get comfortable with the idea of sleeping in a stranger's spare bedroom again. And I think the onus is really on the platforms to sort of make sure that the digital trust that they've built up over the last few years um, persists even in a post-COVID world. If anybody, it's the platforms who sort of can solve this problem. And so, you know, the feature that I mentioned that Airbnb is launching of, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of certifying that a host is going to follow a certain set of cleaning protocols approved by the CDC and the Surgeon General um, before their apartment becomes available, 72 hour gaps between stays. All of these are sort of early trust building steps that like, you know, platforms are taking. Um, because you think about like, you know, sort of the, the institutions of trust have changed over the last 10 years. We rely less on brand and government and contracts and more on digital cues, but we still rely on brand and government and contracts. And in many ways, it's conscious choices that the key players, the key platforms have made over the last five years that have made us comfortable getting into a stranger's car and saying, drive me to another city or like, you know, sort of like you're know, handing over the keys of our apartment to, to a stranger. 
And so I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that we are looking at a different landscape. So with Uber, for example, like, you know, business will shift away from pool to sort of the individual Uber, probably from the Uber ecosystem to the Uber Eats ecosystem. For Airbnb, it'll probably shift away from like, you know, the shared bedroom, um, like, you know, sort of uh, <clears throat> product line to the individual apartment product line. Um, so it will be a couple of years of recovery, um, but I think that these companies are sort of past the point where something like this poses an existential threat to them. And in particular, I think the existential threat to their business model is lower than it is for a capital intensive business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and so they're more resilient to it. Uh, so there are a couple of questions, it seems like actually several questions that um, are clearly teed off by your reference to the shift to local from more <clears throat> global. And it takes a couple of different forms. So uh, one is, can brands that are kind of global brands, how can they use this and, and, and thrive in that kind of environment? What can make them feel more local? And, uh, and then also with respect to workers. So is remote work in some ways um, connecting globally uh, and, and so kind of get, getting beyond the local global uh, divide? So I don't know if you have any comments on either of those or both. Okay, no, that, that, that's, that's, that's a great set of questions. I think in sort of thinking about what's going to become more global and what's going to become more local, um, I think like a key dimension is going to be what needs to be physically moved and what can be transmitted digitally. <clears throat> and so if the talent can be like, you know, accessed through a digital channel, um, instead of like, you know, having to sort of move the move the person for the person sort of actually sort of be there physically in the office, uh, we're going to be seeing a shift away from local and towards global because of the greater reliance on digital. I think for things that have to be moved physically, a couple of different changes will occur. I mean, one is that companies, even small companies today can have global supply chains it's not just the Walmarts of the world that can afford global supply chains. And this is a consequence of progress in digital technology. I think we're going to be seeing sort of a step back from that kind of blind, like, you know, sort of let's get our stuff from anywhere in the quest of efficiency and towards sort of thinking about, do you want a global supplier or can you make do with a local? But more importantly, and I think that this will be sort of a real sort of fountainhead of innovation, trying to think about how do you build flexibility into the supply chain? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, what are the ways in which you can find local substitutes um, while relying when business is as usual on like, you know, sort of global supply chains. And so I think, you know, the resilience and the flexibility are going to get a lot more attention relative to the efficiency, which has been the focus for the last 20 years. Um, I don't, you know, I mean, in, in, in the travel sector, I certainly think that local is going to sort of trump global for a few years. Um, that's sort of in a, in a, in a very different context. Um, and in many ways, there has sort of been a trend towards like, you know, buying things that are sourced close to home and so on, instead of relying on sort of like, you know, big box retailers and mass market. Um, that could probably be accelerated. But what I'm really interested in is this balance, especially for a small business, between efficiency and flexibility slash resilience. I know we only have a few minutes left, but you have brought so much insight to the current discussion about the future of work. And I have to ask you a question that sort of addresses that. Obviously, you've touched on in your talk how these technologies and, and automation and just changes in behavior are likely to shift people to doing things themselves like meal prep instead of going to a restaurant that could affect the future of work. You also touched on the <clears throat> idea of like the safety net and one of the, you, you highlighted what the government is doing with the CARES Act uh, to sort of protect through unemployment insurance um, the, the uh, gig economy workers. Uh, but I wonder what you think corporate responsibilities are and whether that 
is different for the larger or smaller corporates. So I just wonder if you could comment on what you see are the implications for the future of work, for sort of opportunities or what this is going to mean for workers and what it means for the safety net. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I mean, first off, um, you know, I, you know, as, as, as we were discussing, I sort of project a slight acceleration in like, you know, sort of automation technologies, perhaps a more profound or like, you know, acceleration of on-demand and platform work. Um, but, but, but to the other points, um, you know, I, probably three or four years ago, the pendulum of on-demand sort of swung really heavily in favor of, for a small fraction of the population, other people doing stuff for me. You know, sort of like the valet on-demand, the Uber for anything. Um, and, you know, we've reached sort of more sort of business model reality normalcy now. But I certainly see two things happening. One is, yes, there are some people who would be doing things themselves instead of getting it on demand. Um, but I think that's going to be overshadowed by the set of people who got used to getting something digitally instead of getting something physically. And so, um, like, you know, I think the do-it-yourself shift is going to be smaller than the digital shift. And so net, I think that this will, we will see sort of growth in like, you know, on demand. Um, you know, I've been an advocate for the last five years for building a stronger social safety net for all arrangements of work, not just full-time employment. Um, I have certainly been encouraged by the fact that the CARES Act gives unemployment benefits to gig workers and not just full-time employees. But, you know, we have a really you know, as we see an acceleration away from employment and towards other work arrangements, I hope one of the things that COVID catalyzes is a rebuilding of the funding model for our social safety net, especially in the US and the UK and Japan, where it's the individual, the company and the government collaborating. It's not like Sweden or Denmark where it's all the government. And there's certainly corporate responsibility, um, but, it's different from what the corporate responsibility is when you employ someone full time. And so the economy is moving to an economy where you have large platforms connecting to millions of tiny micro businesses and the platforms have some responsibility towards these micro businesses that depend on them, including safety net. But the solution eventually is going to have to be a mix, a mix of individual responsibility, platform responsibility and the government paving the way and saying that, yes, this sector of the workforce that is not full-time employee deserves the same sort of benefits and protections that the full-time employees get and really sort of catalyzing the change. And I'm hoping that like, you know, this first step we've seen in the CARE Act, CARES Act is sort of a precursor to sort of much needed and much broader sort of shoring up the safety net in the years to come. Yeah. So we're out of time, which is a shame because there are so many great questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, but I will send them to you and just want to say thank you so much for a terrific conversation today. Thank you. Okay. Of course. And, um, you know, uh, people can always get in touch with me online. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can reach me. So if you had a question and you didn't have a chance to ask it, um, you know, feel free to reach out electronically and um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you for your questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for being here and I hope that you guys stay safe and healthy.